All right, guys, we're going to begin. We've got a great panel here. We've got Slack, Ibotta, and Nerd Wallet coming up. All right. So let's go ahead. Let's kick things off. I want to introduce you guys to Dina Schaefitz. She is the Director of Product Strategy at Prolific Interactive. She's going to go ahead and moderate and introduce this wonderful panel. So hope you guys enjoyed the gelato or are still continuing to enjoy it um, while you guys listen in. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. I um, hope you had a really fantastic day. Um, looking forward to capping it off with these three wonderful panelists talking about the art and science of product. We want to talk both a little bit high-level strategy as well as some specific tactics to relating to testing. Right. So here we've got Phil Carter, a former VC and now director of product at Ibotta, who's focusing on the user experience. Thanks for joining us. Um, Elena Patra, senior product manager at NerdWallet, who's in charge of the mobile apps. And Fareed Mozavat, a growth and product expert, currently leading the upgrades and expansion team at Slack. So most panels like to start with the context of who these people are and where they came from. I don't know that I care about that as much today as why did they do what they do? What problem are they solving? And why is it interesting that they get up every day to solve that problem? Let's start with Phil. Sure. Yeah, so I work for Ibotta. We're a mobile rebates app or shopping rewards app. Uh, we started in grocery. So every time you go to the grocery store at Walmart or Target or your local grocery store, earn cash back on everything you purchase in store. Uh, but over the last four years, we've really developed into something much larger. So we now have a mobile shopping business where you can earn cash back every time you take a ride on Uber or make a purchase on Amazon. Uh, and it's been really interesting to work on a product that appeals to such a wide demographic across the country. So we're approaching $250 million in total cash back savings for our users. And I'm excited to be here today. So real quick follow up. Um, one thing that I heard or learned recently is just some of the personal stories of the people that I bought at Impacts. I don't know if you could share a quick. Sure. Yeah, one of the privileges I have being a product manager is I get to talk to so many of our users week in and week out. Um, and when I first started working at Ibotta, it just really impressed me to hear the stories of users for whom the cash back they earn is the difference between Christmas gifts at the end of the year or getting to take a summer vacation with their family. So that's been a rewarding part of the experience. How about you, Ellen? Great. So um, my company is NerdWallet. We're a personal finance startup on a mission to provide clarity for all life's financial decisions. And um, our story started several years ago when the older sister of our CEO, Tim Chen, reached out to him to get advice on how to get the best credit card. Around the same time, his parents also reached to him for advice around uh, buying into mutual funds. And at that time, Tim was a hedge fund analyst. Um, whose expertise was around trading stocks, not necessarily picking credit cards or uh, you know, uh, buying um, retirement funds. However, he did go online and he tried to you know, like, uh, do some quick research and what he found was uh, pretty appalling. So um, he thought that there should be a better way for users to, find, to easily find information um, uh, around you know the different financial decisions that they had to make in a way that was a lot more transparent and less biased instead of you know feeling that uh, they get pushed specific financial products and so long story short um, he started putting together this spreadsheet where he manually entered a lot of the credit card information he shared it with his sister and then his sister shared it with her friends and sort of became viral and then he built a site and eventually a company that became the source of truth for all life's financial decisions and um, today we actually help millions of users tackle all of these decisions. Very cool. Great. Great. So uh, I run the upgrades and expansion team, uh, self-service business at Slack. Uh, Slack is where work happens. Uh, it helps you connect all of the uh, communication inside your organization, not only between people, but also between tools. Uh, so uh, the reason that I, what this matters, or I think it's important, is uh, you spend all day at work, or knowledge workers spend all of their day at work at a desk communicating with other people and communication is really the most important thing that we do in knowledge work so I took this role because it was it's so exciting to work on something that not only I use all day which is a super rare product experience I haven't really worked on anything I use 90% of my day every day but also that so many millions of people across the world use and uh, we really like believe that something like Slack will be inevitable everywhere, mm -hmm. that every knowledge worker in the world will use something like it, whether it's Slack or something like it. So uh, it's an exciting project to work on. So. 
Um, so one thing what really uh, recently happened at uh, my company Prolific is we like reevaluated our company level values. Um, that's something that you know many companies have their values. They use HR. They use them in branding. I'm interested in how, as product leaders, you're taking your company level values and applying them to your team to create a better product. Um, start with you. Yeah, so I think that especially running growth-oriented things, uh, values are a really important part of how we do growth. Uh, and the way that I've run a growth team has been different at every single company based on those values. Okay. So I'll use a couple of examples. Like one is at Instacart, one of our core values when I first started there was, uh, was called uh, sense of urgency. We now call it every minute counts. Uh, and it was really a deep part of the culture because the company was started basically out of the CEO's like apartment with using Ubers to deliver groceries, uh, that like you should do things that don't scale, you should be really scrappy and getting the answers quickly is the most important thing. Uh, also with the deep customer focus because of the fact that they came from Amazon, but really about speed and urgency. Whereas at Slack are like one of our most important values, one of them is courtesy and the other is empathy. And so we're thinking about our customers all day and we're working on an enterprise product, things that people use at work. We're helping them solve and do their most important task of the day. The thing that they get paid for, the thing that they get fired or not, or promoted on. And so the way we don't take as the same approach of just hacking things together and pushing really hard, we don't think in terms of getting users to do things. We think in terms of encouraging them, educating them, uh, in terms of uh, make, helping them make better decisions. And we don't, we don't want to nag or be annoying because we're part of your day-to-day -day work experience. So these kinds of things are important not only in terms of what kinds of experiments you'll run, but also how you manage and operate your growth team and what kinds of what what you're optimizing for as a process. Yeah, I think when we had talked earlier, you mentioned also uh, craft craftsmanship. Yeah, so craftsmanship is also one of the core values of Slack and also a really important thing on a growth team. It was actually one of the hardest things for us to get right when we first got started. Because I think a lot of people here growth, especially new engineers and, and things like that, are people from other companies. And they come at it with this idea that like, okay, we're gonna throw shit at the wall, we're gonna see what works, we'll fix stuff later, uh, we will just try things, and if they work, then we'll make them better. But we don't really have that luxury. One, because everybody on the team is really like incentivized to build great things, and also it's such an important part of our product value and our brand value to be tight and clean and thoughtful and have courtesy and be fun. And so those edges matter, so the basic decision we always have to make is, we don't get to skimp on quality. We make smaller things better. We don't make bigger things scrappier. Um, and so we can still get velocity, but we have to choose different chunks. Awesome. Um, and then Phil, I know that I, I learned recently that Ibotta stands for something. Yeah, so each of the letters in Ibotta is one of our company values. And the one that I find the most interesting is the last. A good idea can come from anywhere. It's a little long-winded. Uh, but when you think about innovation. So wait, is it a good idea? Yeah, the A in okay. Ibotta is the a good idea can come from anywhere. Like I said, it's a little long, but easy to remember. Yeah. Um, and the reason I like it so much is when you think about innovation or what, what makes an innovative product, I'm guessing mobile rebates isn't the first industry that pops into a lot of folks' minds. Um, but to our users, it's really important. These folks care about every cent, every dollar they save, and to them it's actually a game in many cases. They love finding the best deals out there. There's a Facebook group called... I bought a friends and bonuses where people compare the most money they save in a given trip, right? And so it's important to be able to channel the best ideas we possibly can from everybody who works at our company and beyond uh, in order to build the most innovative product for our users. And so hopefully our users can really feel that. I'm a Slack user. I'm sure there are plenty of Slack users in the audience. And when I heard about empathy and thoughtfulness, that's something you definitely feel when you're using that product. Yeah. Speaking of, a good idea can come from anywhere. Let's talk about creative testing, creative approaches to testing, okay? So, uh, Elena, when we talked earlier, uh, you had brought up what I thought was a really interesting example of how you leveraged what people normally think is like a marketing tool that marketing people deal with to inform product. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, this particular test was a, uh, an experiment that we run with um, a tool called Star StormAven. It's basically a tool to run tests on your App Store pages. And it all started with uh, a hypothesis, which is the foundation of a good experimentation. So a year ago, when we first launched our um, flagship app, um, 
we launched it uh, using a specific value proposition that was around credit cards, and we did that in an effort to um, align with a core value prop that we had on web, but also with the main messaging around a big marketing push that we were doing at that time. Um, and, but shortly after launching, we started observing a couple of trends. So one, um, we did not see the install conversion that we thought you know, the app should have. And so we started digging a little bit deeper into that. And we also started seeing negative reviews on uh, the app stores around users that were not really happy with the fact that they had to um, uh, uh, create an account in order to, you know, like find the best credit card. And so we formed a hypothesis around flipping the value prop and instead of focusing on credit cards, um, focusing the value prop of the app around credit score and using credit score um, to um, uh, get a better sense of what kind of credit cards you would qualify for. And so we use Store Maven, which is basically we ba basically allows you to clone different you know uh, uh, app store pages and direct uh, part of your traffic into those uh, clone pages, and run the test for several weeks. Uh, we actually saw a lift in conversion, in install conversion, um, of 20 percent, which is huge. Um, so uh, what we ended up doing was not only you know updating our app store pages, but also um, expand that to reshuffle our entire onboarding experience, but also inform our product direction, which is basically what we have today. So our value prop today is centered around credit score, and we have also like expanded that. Yeah, I love that because you're not only um, improving like ac from an acquisition perspective, but you're also learning things that can help inform the product, the product experience. Totally, yeah. How about you, Fareed? Ever gotten creative? Yeah, so in the testing department? one of the first things when I uh, first got to Instacart was uh, trying to figure out what our growth levers were. We really hadn't thought about it beyond just like driving more signups and, and driving more activations. So like a lot of onboarding stuff. So, and so in st outside of acquisition, we knew like sort of in our hearts that like whether or not you could get like a quick delivery was an important part of our growth equation and whether or not we had, you know, uh, users came back again. And so this is a pretty hard thing to test because it involves so much operational complexity from like the shoppers on the ground up to the systems that decide which shoppers get what all the way around. So there's no such thing as like a fair, a safe test that you can do unless <laughs> we did a sort of weird thing where we wanted to get two groups that were equivalent and we wanted one group to have on-demand delivery, so anything under two hours, and the other to have no on-demand delivery, and a third that was sort of like the normal algorithm. And so basically what we did was we had to break the experience for some people, which was not great, but it was in the, it was in the spirit of science. Yeah, right. uh, we had to make an impossible situation for our op ops team for another group of people because no matter what, whether there was a shopper there or not, they had to be able to like deliver groceries that they ordered because they would have availability all the time. And then a third group, so that was like not in the test at all. So this is important, like that wasn't a real control group because their, they get, their availability would change based on what these other two groups were doing. And basically what we found was, a sp it was almost like the back test that the previous person from Wall Street Journal talk talked about, was we figured out exactly what the impact of having two and one hour delivery on at all times is on our growth rates, on our retention, and on our new user experience. And so we were able to like put that into them, think about it in terms of the modeling of how we were thinking about growth. So while it wasn't a test we would ship, it wasn't something you would either do or not do, it was like a big time piece of information that we could use to inform our operational plans going forward. So that's probably the like most it's weird, creative, non, yeah. Yeah, non-traditional test I've ever run. Out there. Uh, how about you, Phil? You've done anything yeah, so crazy today, or green or creative? Oh. Uh, today I bought as a very test-driven culture. We A-B test most of the major feature updates we make in the app. But in the very early days of I bought it, we're based in Denver, uh, and the first office was right near um, Coors Field, Rocky Stadium. And so before we even had a product, um, a number of the early employees that I bought a went and set up a table and uh, gave away water on hot summer days to people walking to the Rockies game in exchange for spending five minutes interacting with wireframes, whether they were on paper sometimes, just sketched out on paper, or in Balsamic or another prototyping tool. 
And that was the early feedback that really drove a lot of the innovation behind the first version of Ibotta five years ago. Um, so it just goes to show you don't, you don't always need super scientific tools when you're just getting started mm -hmm. yeah. in order to really make an impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love the opposite ends of the spectrum of right. complicated, right. technical yeah. to yeah. super scrappy, just needs some feedback to it move it on to yeah. the next step. Awesome. So obviously we've been talking all day about um, approach to experimentation, the overall process. I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at um, how our panelists um, approach testing um, and approach that process as a whole, but hearing from them, like each, from each one of them about the different steps. So let's start with you, Elena, like very top, at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. How do you come up with a set of hypotheses uh, that you then will consider whether yeah. you test or yeah, we actually don't have a shortage of those because it's like sort of like part of our culture to continually, you know, challenge our thinking and think about drivers before solutions. But uh, we typically look at three specific channels to form hypotheses. Um, so number one is looking at data, looking at analytics, funnels to identify potential issues, which is the number one thing that, you know, starts like forming the hypothesis. Um, from that point, we also um, work li really closely with customer support, which uh, I think, you know, have been, like in all the companies that are worked at us, uh, is a perfect, you know, channel for getting a lot of feedback and a lot of things that you would not necessarily think could be either problems but also opportunities. So it could be, you know, issues that um, users are uh, coming up with or uh, areas that uh, they might find confusing or complicated. So a lot of opportunities that you might not necessarily like think about it on the top of your head. Um, we also look at uh, customer reviews, so reviews that we get in uh, the app stores. Um, we try to identify patterns, and again, there are um, tools that are available to do that. Uh, one that we use is called AppBot, so you can track sentiment, but also identify like topics, specific topics that users are either you know really happy about or not happy about. Um, and then the third one is qualitative, um, and it's more about using user research that we do at a regular cadence, uh, just to see whether there are any blind spots, but also um, if we identify a particular issue, uh, we bring in users or we run you know, online um, uh, user testing sessions with them, just to get like more dig in a little bit deeper. So I would say, yeah, these are the three main. Yeah, that's a source for a really long list of great hypotheses. Yeah. So you've got that long list. Mm -hmm. Phil, what do you do with that list? Are you going to test everything on that list? No. Hopefully so what not. do you, how are you going to narrow that down? How are you going to like validate it prior yeah, to? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think that's the hardest part about being a product leader is figuring out what not to do. Um, so we, I'll pick up where Elena left off. So um, we do a lot of user interviews. Every week we try to have at least five users in the office. Um, we'll use prototyping software like Envision or Principal in order to uh, put a version of a product feature or a full product experience in front of these users and get their reactions. Sometimes they're more empathy-oriented interviews, so uh, in, in extreme cases we won't have a prototype at all, but we'll, we'll start very open-ended and just ask a user what matters to them, what are you thinking about when you go to the store, are you thinking about time, or are you thinking about money, what's most important to you, all the way to more directed interviews where we'll ask more quantitative questions, like on a scale from zero to 10, how would you rate um, the quality of this user experience or how intuitive this user experience is? And then as we get in more to the refinement phase, or so as we're approaching the point where we're ready to prioritize a project, um, build it, and put it out there to A-B test, um, we'll use tools like Usability Hub. Um, there are plenty of others out there, but we'll do things like five-second tests where you put two different versions of a, or five-second five tests where we put a screen up and then test recall of what a user remembers, preference tests where we test two different screens against each other and see which treatment wins, um, or clickability tests where we'll take a user through a flow and see what percentage actually make it through, and also where certain users stumble or fall down so that we can identify pain points to fix in the final product. Ultimately, I think the big takeaway is building product is expensive. It takes time, it takes resources. Um, so you wanna make sure that you've honed your hypothesis as much as possible before you actually make that investment. Okay, so let's say you've narrowed it down. You're very clear on what you wanna test. Let's talk about running those tests and then what you do after the test, which is probably the most important part. Yeah, sure, so um, I have come to believe that 
the decision about whether you ship or don't ship an experiment is the most important piece and actually the work that you do around that decision is even more important. So uh, it's not important whether or not the thing won. That's a pretty straightforward thing. You look at your dashboard, you click on it, it says it's red or green and you go forward. But the important question is the why and also the communication of that why because what you're trying to do is build a real strong loop all the way back through to the organization. Uh, in terms of like what you've learned and what you haven't learned and building better ideas. I think it's really important to focus on a lot of talk and testing groups is about velocity shipping faster, but I actually think it's really about learning faster and getting to better understanding faster. Because especially at Slack where we're trying to be very, very careful about the user experience, we, we don't want to ship trash. We're like very, we take a, we take a very uh, close approach to what we decide to put out there. So um, the best thing I've found to do this is actually, I've, I've tried email, I've tried reports, I've tried dashboards, I've tried Slack, I've tried lots of different things, but honestly the best thing that works for this is one meeting, mm -hmm. usually once a month uh, for our team, but I've done it at Zynga, we did it every week, um, but is called a numbers review, and you sit down and every product manager is responsible for reviewing every experiment that they've shipped and have results on, talk through what they observed, why and really like it's an it's it's sort of like in its best form like it's a discussion and it's almost like you're picking apart the results and you're thinking through why these things have happened so um this is really important because i think the biggest mistake people make is make experiments and the decision is yes or no mm -hmm. turn it on mm -hmm. but what you're really trying to get at is what should i do next and so these meetings are a great opportunity for everybody on the team to get that mm -hmm. and they spread like that's the cool thing is mm -hmm. now we're running this meeting we have people from the sales organization there we have people from customer support mm -hmm. we have people from every other part of the company finance mm -hmm. included. you have donuts don't you no, we have no donuts. <laughs> well, we, all we have is no insights. Uh, <laughs> no donuts, just insights. Gelato. Um, we also include our track against our goals and top line metrics, so there's like a good rhythm to that. Mm -hmm. um, and it feels the same every week, but also any of our user research and uh, data analysis also goes in that meeting. So it's a holistic piece from like top line, how are we doing? Second is what have we learned recently? And last is what is every single experiment we've ever run mm -hmm. and what's the outcome? Mm -hmm. And this thing like changes the game. It mm -hmm. really like really does because um, the most important thing, it often looks, especially at an enterprise software company, mm -hmm. uh, it looks like you're not really doing that much because you're working on these tiny things mm -hmm. compared to like one quarter roadmaps or one year roadmaps on other teams. And so that cadence of every month, here's what we learned, here's what we're doing, here's what you can do with it, mm -hmm. is super, super important. Mm -hmm. awesome. I agree, and if we have time, I actually yeah. bring donuts. Oh. Um, <laughs> but I think there's tremendous value in those meetings, not just to you know like fully understand what exactly are you you know, achieving with that experiment, but because I also think in these discussions, that's the genesis of the next like round of experiments yes. because you come up with like new hypotheses yep. um, to basically like, iterate on the experiment itself, so. I mean, you think you understand things until you try right. to write them down. Exactly. And then you write down your outcome and you're like, wait, I can't say that yeah. because I don't actually know this other totally, thing. And then yeah. you go dig in the data and boom, light bulb mm -hmm. goes off. Mm -hmm. So um, the act of building those slides, of writing those results is so, so important. Mm -hmm. I think so an important question follows is then when we're looking at our set of hypotheses, to what extent are you like continuing from previous, like what you learned from a previous yeah. experiment versus generating like new hypotheses based on what you're hearing from reviews or customer feedback or any of that kind of thing? Any thoughts? Uh, I'm happy to go on this. Like, sure. I, like to beat a, uh, I, I like to beat a hypothesis to death uh, <laughs> before quitting on it because the process by which you decided that was important to work on should have been pretty rigorous. Okay. And so, and I also like to be very, very focused in terms of the themes that our team is working on. I don't like to work against 10 things. We have three or four themes right now that we're operating against, and that's it. And honestly, only two of them really matter right now. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna grind against those, against our leading indicators and other things until it is like, there's either nothing here or there's definitely something, something. here and it's done. Um, so that's how I like to operate. I don't like to jump into new stuff. Mm -hmm. You guys have anything to add? Yeah, I would agree. Same. Uh, we tend to, to do the same thing, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would say similar. I think focus is just so important mm -hmm. in product, and I think so often you can give up on a theme or an initiative a little bit too early because there tends to be exponential some returns. Some to test. Yeah. yeah, once you get really down into it, I think some of the greatest gains come towards the end. Okay. Sounds good. All right, so let's talk real quick. Uh, we've heard a number of these today, but what are some of, the, some of the common mistakes that you see? Maybe just pick like one key mistake that you see happen often or that you know maybe your team has done um, at one point in time. It's cool, everybody has to learn. Bill, sure. do you want to yeah, start? I can start? 
I guess I'll do two quick ones. One is um, often the simplest tests yield the most significant results. So one specific uh, project comes to mind. We used Optimize to run a test on our pre-registration screen in Ibotta. And we had several different versions that we tested. One was our designer just went off the deep end. This guy loves animations. He built the most beautiful, complex screen. It was just one screen, but there was a lot going on. Um, people's faces, people at the grocery store shopping in different parts of the shopping mall. Um, and then there was another one that just very simply stated right in the middle of the screen, $10 welcome bonus when you sign up. That existed on the first one, but it was drowned out by all this additional noise, all this additional stuff on screen going on. So when we showed these two treatments internally, everybody loved the first one, right? Because it was beautiful, it was sexy, people really liked it. Um, the simple one that just had the call to action for the $10 welcome bonus drove a 6% lift in registration rates. Uh, the more complex one was a 10% decline versus our control. Um, so it just goes to show sometimes the simplest solutions are the best. Um, and then the second one, and I won't go into too much detail, is just local, be, beware of local maxima. So it's very easy to churn and churn and churn against uh, what you view to be the optimal outcome for your product on any given dimension. But sometimes you can lose sight of the fact that you may be at the top of the wrong mountain and that there's this much bigger opportunity if you're willing to sort of break the app down to its studs and rebuild it. So uh, six months ago, we totally rebuilt and relaunched the Ibotta app. Totally new design and a lot of new backend infrastructure as well to help with load times and performance. Uh, and it was a six month project, it took a big investment, but we saw over a 20% lift in most of our metrics. Sometimes you just have to be willing to throw it all out and start over. Scary, but yeah. <laughs> Elena, what are um, Cool, so um, I'm gonna talk about two common mistakes. One of them we actually are guilty of almost doing and then doing. Um, Thank you for admitting it. Though. Yeah, <laughs> and that is calling uh, tests too early. Um, so this is very common with either inexperienced or over-eager teams that fall in love with their solutions. And we almost did that in the uh, experiment that I was uh, talking about earlier with um, testing the different app store pages. So uh, we reached statistical significance of 80% at some point, and I was talking with my team, and they really like, wanted to stop the experiment. But I was like, no, we're going to let it run for a few more days. And it actually fluctuated for a few days. Um, if you run you know, a lot of experiments, you know that an 80% can you know, like easily win, depending on you know, like traffic. Um, so we did not do that mistake for that experiment. Um, but we did it for a second test, uh, which was around icon testing. And similarly, the team was like really in love with one of the uh, variants, and they wanted to call that the test. Um, we paused the test, but th we then decided to rerun it, and it came into a wash, uh, which was equally, you know, like frustrating for uh, an A/B test, and actually, like, a pretty common. Um, so, yeah, just the, the 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 theme there is you need to, you know, let the tests run for um, uh, a full, you know, like amount of time. Usually, you need a full week just to, you know, make sure that there are no seasonalities in traffic. Um, you also need to be really vigilant, vigilant about um, calculating the sample size of your traffic. And you need to do that before you start the test so that you, get, you, you do not get tempted. And I would say in terms of statistical significance, always aim for at least 95%. Um, so that's one. And then the second one, um, it's actually a, a common theme for uh, teams that have, uh, I think, a culture of testing. And, at some point, when they get really good at it, they tend to focus a lot on you know, individual metrics that I call a little bit like vanity metrics. Um, so they can get really, really good at driving one specific you know, metric, but they kind of like lose the big picture. And so um, they can easily you know, like run a lot of tests and drive a lot of results around one specific metric. But um, if they look at the overall like, KPIs of their uh, product or business, that may not necessarily like, lead to a good experience. So uh, that's also something that you, know, you need to be careful about. Good yeah. points. Uh, I, the one I'm most embarrassed about that is uh, and comes into play a lot is not cleaning up experiment code properly. Um, this one has bit me really hard. I, so 
we had this experiment in Instacart to drive subscription revenue uh, around our uh, Express product, which is like an all-you-can-eat, as many deliveries as you want, uh, pay up front for the year kind of product. And it's a, it was a huge growth driver for the company. It continues to be today. And we ran the best experiment we've ever run on it uh, using a trial. It, it doesn't matter what the experiment was. We were like, you know, I pounded my chest in the meeting. It was like, this is really great. Look at this. We killed it. We like nailed our goal early. We're so awesome, blah, blah, blah. I told the engineer to turn it, to set it to 100%, walked away, didn't pay that close of attention to the top line metrics. So this is to your point, like it, A-B tests don't matter. Like all you're trying to do is move the actual metrics right. that you're trying to move up. And if they're not moving, you should be concerned. So at first I was a little concerned. It, things looked a little weird. I was like, okay, that's kind of weird, but like maybe there's some seasonal stuff or something else, or there was a novelty effect early this that wasn't faded. right before you went on vacation, right? No, luckily okay. I wasn't. Uh, and then I like started digging in, and I was like being paranoid. So this is another thing. Growth people like want to win, so when things go badly, it's common to keep it to yourself. When really what you should be doing is yelling about the problem. Uh, as soon as I mentioned it to an engineer, I was like, this doesn't look like it's exposing to everybody anymore. He like found a bug in the way he was checking this two-step flow where only people who had been in the experiment in the original assignment were still oh, getting the experiment even though it was ramped up. So we had like over time the number of people seeing it had gone down because everybody was taking the right action. We turned we like turned it back on and then but it was super embarrassing. I had to like stand up in front of the CEO and be like I'm sorry, I hurt the business for two weeks because I wasn't paying close enough attention. It happens to the best of us, yeah. but hopefully everyone in this room will learn from that mistake. Yeah. So, so check that what you expect to have happen happens after you yeah. close an experiment. Mm -hmm. Good point. On that note, we're about out of time. Um, we are not going to be able to do a Q&A, but um, our panelists will be around during happy hours. So I highly encourage you to chat with them because they're fantastic humans and doing great work. So let's give us a, them a round of applause. Thank you.